Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's. Glad you're here. Glad those who are joining us via television are watching. So uh, you're very welcome. And just a few announcements before we get started. The altar flowers this morning are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of Joseph H. Kerr, father to Louise, Joe, Diana, and David. So very good. Um, there are a couple things here in the bulletin that I want to point out. Uh, we were intending to have a luncheon on the 26th after the service. But in discussion with many of you, um, there are going to be a number of folks absent. We just have these kind of vacation plans going on where folks are absent. So uh, I think we're going to postpone the luncheon. We're going to come up with a date where we can get as many folks together as, as we can. And that's not going to be on the 26th. So uh, watch for a date for that. Um, it will be coming soon. So uh, let's see, what else? Tuesday evening Bible study is uh, continuing on Zoom. Phil and Shelly are away. And so uh, we will, I will be leading the study this Tuesday and I will be here at the church building. So we'll do the study from the church building, but it will be on Zoom. So, you know, if you're used to joining on Zoom, join on Zoom but you are welcome to come to the, the building as well. So, uh, and then Tuesday, 7 a.m., we have morning prayer. I'm going to postpone that this week. Uh, so we'll pray from home together. Uh, and let's see, what else? Soup kitchen there, 10 a.m. for St. Paul's group on Wednesday. And then the rest you can see there. It is TV Sunday today, so we do welcome those who are watching. Um, okay, are there any other? One more thing on the prayer list. We've been praying for Tommy Shorts, and uh, he passed away on Friday. And so we didn't have the bulletin update, but we want to keep uh, Charlotte and the family in prayer as they mourn his loss. So, um, so that's a note there. And I think that is it. If there are any other announcements, let me know after. We'll make sure we get those broadcasted. Uh, our call to worship this morning is Exodus 3 and verses 3 to 6. Exodus chapter 3 and verses 3 to 6. Uh, can everyone hear okay? Do you hear the fans at all? I'll keep them moving. What you, you do? Okay. Uh, well, I'll turn those off here in a, in a minute. Um, but let's uh, let's start with our call to worship. Exodus chapter three, verses three to six. This text is quoted. Yeah, Joe, if you want to turn those off. Yep. Uh, thank you. Exodus three is quoted. Um, in our text this morning for Mark, Mark 12. And so we're talking here, Jesus is going to use this text in an interesting way, and we're going to talk about that. So, but this is the text that will call us uh, to worship this morning, and it's chapter 3 in Exodus, verses 3 to 6. If you recall, Israel was in bondage to Egypt, and Moses even though he's raised by Pharaoh, he's gone away from there. And he sees this bush that is burning as he is in the wilderness, as he's, as he's leading a flock and so forth, as he's pasturing a flock. And, and he's got to find out what it is. So we come to uh, chapter three here, verses three to six. Hear God's word as it calls us to worship. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come 
near here. Remove your sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. But here ends the reading of God's word. Let us now ask for his presence in worship. Our gracious heavenly father, as we come as your people today to worship you, to do that very thing, to call upon your name, to hear your word read and preach, to sing your praises. We pray that you unite us in voice and in heart and in mind, that we might glorify you. And we ask now for the presence of your Holy Spirit to lead us in this way. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Those that are willing and able, if you will stand for our opening hymn, it's hymn number 240, Bear Lord Jesus. Okay, turn to the Word of God again with the Old Testament reading. And again, this passage too is quoted in our text uh, for Mark this morning. This is Deuteronomy 25, and we'll be reading verses 5 to 10. And this is Moses giving Israel, after Israel's been brought out, he's now giving them. Uh, we're beyond the Ten Commandments. Now it's these laws on how to live in the land. And in this section, we're talking about the leveret laws. And leveret is a Latin word meaning brother-in-law or the brother of a husband. And this has to do with the continuing of um, uh, a man's family in the sense that if the man marries and then the man dies without children, 
the wife is to marry the brother in order to carry on uh, the name and so forth, the family. And this is something that is laid out here. And so uh, we read about this. This is going to be quoted by the Sadducees in Mark's gospel as we look at it. So we're going to read verses 5 to 10, just a short, short passage here. So it says this, when brothers live together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. It shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of his dead brother, so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. But if the man does not desire to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate to the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to establish a name for his brother in Israel. He is not willing to perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of his city shall summon him and speak to him. And if he persists and says, I do not desire to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the sight of the elders and pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. And she shall declare, thus it is done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. In Israel, his name shall be called the house of him whose sandal is removed. So there you have it. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so we're going to talk about that today. All right, uh, now we come to the reciting of a confession of faith, the Apostles' Creed, and we'll look at that at 137 in your hymnal. Okay, so confession of faith, the Apostles' Creed. Um, let's see here. All right. So let us, uh, if able and willing, stand and recite this together. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So just, uh, you can be seated. Um, but I just wanted to point out here, there are a couple points that we're going to be talking about that are even in this confession of faith. That we're, uh, he rose again from the dead. And then in that last part, you know, we talk about, I believe in the Holy Spirit, right? And then the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of the body, the resurrection of the body. So we're not just disembodied spirits for eternity. It is the resurrection of the body. We're going to talk about that. Uh, so... We come now to our time of prayer, and uh, it is a prayer of confession of sin and the seeking of assurance of pardon, and as is our practice, I'll give you uh, a moment to pray silently, and then I'll lead us in prayer, and we'll close together with the Lord's Prayer, okay? So let us, uh, let us do that now. Let us pray.
Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege it is to be called by your name, to gather in your name, and to realize that that possibility only happens because of your son, Jesus Christ. It is through him that you open relationship to your people. That through his righteousness, we as sinful people may find forgiveness and a righteousness that is not our own, but that enables us to call upon your name, to have fellowship with you, to recognize that you will hear us. You even call us to come and to find what we need in our hour of need, that you are there, that you desire relationship with us that you are renewing us through the Holy Spirit into all that has been afforded through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. So, Father, we ask for that forgiveness. We ask that you open our eyes to our sin, that we may confess, that we may be made whole, that we would endeavor time and time again to seek your face, to confess our sins, to turn from them. Help us to do that, we pray. Be gentle with us and yet reveal it to us. We thank you for who you are, all of these things that you are, holiness, righteousness, goodness, truth, grace, and love. Let us experience these things in your presence and find the fullness of joy that is there as a result of Christ. Father, we also pray not only for the forgiveness of our sins, but the assurance that we are yours, that we belong to you, that we are your people, that is covenant. That we may have that sense of belonging, that we may know you are there for us, that you care for us. There are times when uh, we feel the absence of your presence and we wonder, but we pray, Father, in those times that we would be reassured that you are there. And the fact that we desire you would testify to your very presence. So Father, we also pray for those who are on our hearts and minds today, we would intercede for them. We ask not only for those who struggle with illness to find healing, physically, but also spiritually, that you would bring them to an awareness of their sin that they might find, as we did, help, rescue, love and care, meaning and purpose, all of these things. So we commit to you, Bill and Brenda and Jack, and Gwen, and Jim, and Nora, and June, Kalina, Elaine, and Ron, Rosemary, Roy, and Janice, and Barb. We pray especially for Barb, knowing that she has suffered a couple falls and, and is struggling. We commit her to you. We ask that you bring healing over these days that she might join us once again here in worship. We pray for Susie. We pray for Wilda. We pray for Marvin and Marilyn as they are apart from us. And we, we lift up Mary and we ask, oh Lord, 
again for healing for these folks, that they would know your presence. We pray also for those who mourn the loss of loved ones. And we think of Tom Short's family. We pray for them. Again, that you would comfort as only you can. Father, we also think of this congregation as we grow together in our relationships with one another and our relationship with you. We ask for wisdom. We ask that your Holy Spirit continue to knit us together, to join us in truth and in love. And we pray for an opportunity to gather, to have a meal together, and to rejoice in one another's company. We pray for growth in number as well, that you would use us as ministers of your grace and truth in this community. We pray likewise for all the congregations who lift up your name today. For there are enough people in this place, this city, to fill every church. We pray to that end, that it is your body that you would bring your people to it, that we might grow and rejoice in your name. We pray for our family members. We pray for those who are unbelieving. We ask again that if you give us the opportunity, let us be faithful in it to carry it out. We pray for our children and our children's children. We pray for those who travel. We pray that you show them mercy. And those who are even now having time together with family, we pray that you would give them peace. Shalom. So Father, we pray all of these things along with the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Okay. Young people's message. Come now to the <laughs> young people's message. <laughs> so Thomas is already waving, huh? He's already had some sugar this morning. So it's, he's ready. Okay. Um, all right. So young people, here's what I want to talk to you about. Um, I want to talk to you about an argument, thinking in an argument. Now, sometimes we think of arguments as, you know, you have two parties and they're debating a point and it can be heated and angry and that kind of argument. That's not what I'm, what I'm talking about in terms of an argument. There's another definition of argument. Argument is, um, it's more the idea of a reason or set of reasons that are used to kind of persuade others of an idea or, or an action being right or wrong. So we give reasons, you know, we say, you know, if, if, if someone says, well, I want to go to the beach today, and someone else says, well, why do you want to go to the beach today? What do you start the sentence with? What do you start the response with? Well, you start it with because, because. And then that follows, you know, what, what you're going to do is give reasons as to why. So I want us to think today. This passage that we're going to look at is, is about thinking today. So first of all, let me give you a, a kind of a mind, something to get the mind going. It's a little story, and um, you can tell me the response. Think about this. You're at a fork in the road in which one direction leads to the city of lies, where everyone always lies and the other fork leads to the city of truth where everyone always tells the truth so you come to this fork in the road there's a person at the fork who lives in one of the cities but you're not sure which one what question could you ask the person to find out which road leads to the city of truth? So I want you to think about that. I think, you know, you got the story there, right? You come to a fork in the road and one direction leads to the city of lies, one to the city of truth, and there's a person there. And um, so the question is, uh, you know, uh, what was the question? <laughs> What question could you ask that person to find out which fork leads to the city of truth? So think about that. I'll ask you that afterwards. And uh, I'm not going to give you the answer. I have the answer, but I'm, I'm going to withhold it. So this is what we're doing, though. We're looking at a particular passage in Mark this morning that is about an argument, these reasons. And you have to decide based on this argument, based on this set of reasons, is it something that is good or is it something that isn't good? Does the argument make sense? Is it sound? That's what I want you to think about. Carefully think about that. And so it is critical thinking. And God asks his people to do that very thing. Even you and me to think about the reasons of things. And so as you do that, as you listen to the text this morning, as we read this text with this argument, there are two things wrong, I tell you right up front, two things wrong with the argument that is given to Jesus by the Sadducees. And Jesus points out two things, and I want you to listen to the text and message and tell me after, what are they? What are they? So then what is the treat as we think? think about things. What is the treat? The Bible, God is asking you to think, and he wants you then to have, yeah, smarties. <laughs> yeah, smarties. Okay, so it's smarties. We haven't had smarties in a while. You know, those are kind of nice. I was going for nerds, but I couldn't find them, so I went for the smarties. So that's it. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to talk to the young hearts and young minds about your word and about you and how you desire in us minds that think, that follow your thoughts after you. Let us come and reason with you. 
Let us think about these things. Give us understanding in that way. We pray that for these young hearts and young minds. We pray it also for all of us that we grow in wisdom. So we commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, our passage this morning in Mark's gospel. It's another short vignette, short kind of interaction, pericope, whatever you want to call it, short passage there, verses 18 to 27. We're going to read these and see what they have to say. So it's verses 18 to 27 in Mark's gospel, chapter 12. Again, I'm reading from the New American Standard. It may be slightly different in your translation, but we'll talk about some of these things. There is a structure, there is a literary structure to this uh, whole section here. And uh, you can see verse 18 parallels verse 27. And the center is verse 24, if you will. Isn't this not the reason you are mistaken? So we're going to read this. And I want you to think about this, you know, as a sandwich, as it builds to the centerpiece. But um, we're going to walk through it. So it's, it's, it'll become, I think, easy to understand, I'm hoping. And so let's read it first. And we'll go from there. Hear God's word. Chapter 12, verses 18 to 27. Some Sadducees who say that there is no resurrection came to Jesus and began questioning him, saying, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. There were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died, leaving no children. The second one married her and died, leaving behind no children, and the third likewise. And so all seven left no children. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, when they rise again, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you are mistaken? that you do not understand the scriptures or the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. Here ends the reading of God's word. So let's look at this passage. N.T. Wright, Tom Wright, in his classic work on the resurrection, it's called The Resurrection of the Son of God describes our text here and its parallels as far and away the most important passage about resurrection in the whole gospel tradition. I want you to think about that. You know, uh, we've been seeing these little stories, these sequences of stories and it's like, you know, the, the authorities, the Jewish authorities come out, let's trap them this way, let's trap them that way, let's put this in front of them, let's do that, let's try to get them here, try to get them there. And here's this little story, just a few verses of interaction, and it is far and away the most important passage about resurrection in the whole gospel tradition. I would agree with that. 
This little story holds so much. So let's look about it. It is this short passage we discover here in it, how central, how foundational the teaching of resurrection is to both God, who he is, his nature, his character, and God's word. So the thing I want you to take away uh, this morning is this. At Passover, Jesus teaches Israel that their very existence is the result of God being a God of resurrection, not a God of the dead. It's at Passover now that Jesus teaches Israel, and he teaches all of us, that their very existence, who they are, is the result of of God being a God of resurrection, not a God of the dead. Our context, as you know, we're in Mark's gospel, and we know how instrumental this is to Isaiah, or how Isaiah is so instrumental to Mark and the good news and the new and greater exodus that is, that is coming, that is described in this gospel, and how Jesus is king, but not, in a, not as a king in the way that so many of his day thought he would be, it's quite the opposite. Nevertheless, a king. And our immediate context, if you remember, it is the time of Passover. Jerusalem is packed with people in preparation for celebrating one of the greatest feasts of Israel, that of liberation, that of freedom coming out of bondage, God rescuing them, God, in fact, defining who they are in that moment. And then we see with Jesus coming to Jerusalem, through his actions, Jesus made the greatest claims of the highest authorities. He's teaching in the temple. He's questioned on authority. He tells a parable about the vineyard, the wicked tenants, and the death of the owner's son who will be vindicated. And then he's teaching about rendering to God the things that are God's. He's dealing with this question on the poll tax. And I want you to think, you know, and now I can't recall, but there's, there's a name for it. Uh, have you ever seen where you have three distinct paintings? And there are three, but, you know, could be more, but this is three paintings distinct in themselves. You look at each one and each one says something but you line them up together and you can see the bigger picture that they present. I forget what that's called, triptych, something like that. But that's what's going on here with these little stories. When you think about it, you know this, he's teaching in the temple, he's questioned on authority. Who does he bring up? John the Baptist. His connection with John the Baptist. And we know that's where things started with Mark. And then he brings up this parable about the owner of the vineyard and the vineyard itself and the wicked tenants. And we're reminded how this is his progress. Three times he told his disciples as he taught them that he was going to Jerusalem, that he was going to suffer, that he was going to be ridiculed and mocked and beaten and scourged and all of that, killed and then rise from the dead. And you see little bits in these stories. And now we come to a story about resurrection. Are these little things retelling the story of Jesus? It's interesting to think about that. So they're not just happenstance. They're not just random circumstances. But Mark has put these things together in a way that suggests that. So let's look at it. Verses 18. I'm going to take and look at verse 18. But I'm also going to bring together verse 27. So kind of like the sandwich effect here. We're going to look at this little story. So here we have the Sadducees. And who are the Sadducees? We're told. The Sadducees are those who say there is no resurrection from the dead. And of course, the joke is that's why they're Sadducee. They don't believe in the resurrection from the dead. But there's more to it. These are Jewish leaders. These are the aristocrats, the chief priests sympathetic to Rome. In other words, they're kind of 
sympathetic to Rome because they want to keep the peace. They're being enriched and they want to keep being enriched. So keep the peace. These are men of highest standing in Jerusalem. But these are men who also do not believe in new teachings. In other words, they only hold to the first five books of Moses. Anything after that to them is a new teaching. And so they think resurrection is a new teaching. Is that why this, they don't believe in the resurrection? That's one reason. Now, they could also be thinking that, boy, if they advance the cause of resurrection, then that gives people the idea that there is a hope that they can do what they want. They can rise up against the Rome and the consequences, you know, what if you take death away, if you take death out of the equation and there's going to be life after death, then, you know, hey, I can go for anything, right? Um, could that be some of the stuff? I don't know, but one of the things is that they don't believe in the new teaching. So they, in this regard, were against the Pharisees. They stood against the Pharisees in this regard. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Mark tells us that specifically, who say there is no resurrection from the dead. And so they resisted these teachings that they considered new. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. This is Verse 27, this is where we're going. This is what Jesus is going to counter with this idea. They say there's no resurrection, but Jesus is saying he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. This is the framework of it. Jesus says you are greatly mistaken. These, these comments frame the discussion that takes place and the conversation is about God. It's about knowing God. And that resurrection new life is at the very heart of God's character. This is what we're going to find in the midst of these two opposing views. To deny resurrection is to deny the renewal of life. It is to say that death was not an intruder or foreign to God's good creation, but part of it. It's to give death more of a power. So it is to suggest that God's ultimate plan for his people was death and not life. And such a view runs so utterly counter to the scriptures that they are not just mistaken, but greatly mistaken. This is where it's going. So now we're going to look at these verses, take 19 to 22. Teacher, Moses writes. This is what they start with. Teacher, Moses writes. So we are, you know, if we're going to talk about a book, this is the Pentateuch. This is the first five books. When they say Moses writes, they mean the first five books. So this is an argument, a set of reasons based upon the Pentateuch. This is where they start. And it is really what we might call reductio ad absurdum. Have you ever heard of that type of argument? What that means is simply that um, we're going to take a particular thing and we're going to drive it to absurdity. We're going to say, if you hold to this, then I can show you how holding to that is just absurd. And we're going to show you how to do that. And so this is what they're working at. So if you hold to the resurrection, then the Leverate laws, that is the brother-in-law marrying his dead brother's childless widow to keep the inheritance and carry on the name, we're going to show you how that a certain scenario could lead to absurdity. And so their logic goes like this. Assume resurrection is true. Using the commands of Moses, conceive of some absurd or irresolvable situation, which leads to conflict and contradiction, and then conclude that the resurrection is false. Teacher Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child, his brother should take the wife and raise up the offspring of his brother. There it is there. Okay, so this is what Moses commanded. Now, consider this situation. There were seven brothers, right? And he goes on and says each one marries her. Now, in the resurrection, if the resurrection is true, whose wife is she? How can you resolve that one? Right? That's the argument. That's how it goes. And so they quote Moses from Deuteronomy, and we read from Deuteronomy, and applying that extreme example, 
say what if. Well, Jesus will counter here with Moses from Exodus. We're not there yet, but it, it is as close as you get to chapter and verse. He's going to say, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the burning bush? So they didn't have chapters and verses back then. But they used words like that. So he could say Moses in the burning bush, and you knew where he was in the Pentateuch. So then we come, that's the way it's going to go. But verse 23 comes the, the question, this perplexing question. He's laid out the scenario, and then he, uh, the Sadducees then say, in the resurrection, when they rise again, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had her as wife. And they believe in this scenario. They believe that it creates a conflict that she can only be the wife of one. So which one? Since she was married to all seven. And the argument then assumes here, and we see this, the argument assumes a continuity between the present age understanding of marriage and the marriage after resurrection. I, you have to see that. So they don't believe in resurrection, but they're saying if resurrection is true, then the marriage here is same as marriage here. Marriage in present age, same as marriage in after the resurrection. So remember, the Jews believed in two ages, the present age and then the age to come. And the Pharisees and so forth believed in resurrection, but the Sadducees didn't. And so they would use this as an argument but here's where they fail. And this is a failing here of the continuity. They think that marriage in the present age is the same in the age to come or the age of resurrection. That's where their argument falls down. So verse 24, the central, this is the central piece of this small passage is Jesus' response the reason they are mistaken. Jesus points out two flaws in their logic and reasoning. Is this not the reason you are mistaken, that you do not understand the scriptures? So Jesus confronts them on the, the foundation of their argument. They're interpreting scripture. These are the Sadducees. And they're the ones who say, oh, we don't want anything new. We want the Pentateuch. And we're using this now to advance our argument. And Jesus says, you're mistaken in your interpretation of scripture. Now he's going to have to show that. He's going to have to show that, but that's what he says. That's where he starts. And then he says, second, you not only under, uh, misunderstand the scriptures, but you don't understand the power of God either. You fail to grasp the power of God. So Jesus explains the power of God first and the scriptures second. Verse 25 when we look at this, for when they, when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. So now Jesus is saying your assumption, your presupposition that marriage is the same in the present age as in the age of resurrection doesn't work because they're not. There's a break. There's discontinuity. Marriage isn't the same with the present age and the age to come. And so he says, note there is, um, well, he says, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. So we note there's a change in the verb here. And this is something that I think is interesting. R.T. France points this out. There's a change in the verb to rise when they rise from the dead. If you look at verse 23, um, in verse 23, the verb is active. So when the Sadducees use the verb, when they rise, it's active when they rise, when the people rise. But when Jesus uses it in verse 25, it is passive. Now, do we remember what active and passive means? Active means I'm doing the action. Passive means the action is something that is happening upon me or to me. Okay, so Jesus switches the the action from active to passive. It's quite interesting. So when they rise, in other words, Jesus is saying this is something that happens to them. This is the power of God that is taking place. So the primary focus here is the discontinuity between the present age and the age to come. In the resurrection, marriage doesn't continue. They neither marry nor are given in marriage. 
What was the purpose of marriage? Well, the purpose of marriage is to continue to populate the earth, right? Uh, when Jesus um, when Jesus is confronted about divorce, lawful divorce, right? Marriage and divorce, where does he take them? He takes them back to the beginning, but he doesn't do that here. We see in the beginning the power of God in creation. What he does do is take them forward to the new creation. So Wright compares, N.T. Wright compares and contrasts Jesus' response here to his response on marriage and divorce in chapter 10. And in the case of chapter 10, Jesus refers to those early chapters of Genesis and the design of creation that marriage is for a lifetime, and that is the ideal, and they're to populate the earth. Whereas here, Jesus doesn't go back to creation, but forward to new creation. Resurrection is life from death. That is the renewal of life. But are like, uh, then we get this phrase, but are like angels in heaven. And what do you think about that? Have you ever thought about that? So they neither marry nor are given a marriage, but are like angels in heaven. This is a simile. It's a metaphor. And it's in a specific context. So we note that the text doesn't say that in the resurrection, people become angels. Sometimes that's read into this text. That when they die, they become angels. But that's not what is being said. It's said they are like angels, and they're like angels, not in their being, but in the fact that they are neither given in marriage nor take a wife, that kind of thing. So, so uh, we have to understand that. It doesn't say uh, either. It doesn't say that angels are people. Uh, angels or people are sexless. Okay, sometimes we, we think that. The text doesn't say that either. And what I mean by that is angels are neither male or female. We're not told that in this text either. So we have to be very careful of how we uh, read the text itself. So it doesn't say or hint that resurrection means people are disembodied spirits either. It does say that in the resurrection age, people like angels who are in heaven will not participate in marriage. The original design of marriage was and is to populate the earth. Death introduced through the curse interrupted that process. And therefore, no, uh, um, hence the Leverate law. So in other words, Death interrupts it, the brother or the husband dies, and now that name needs to be carried on. And so we have those laws and Moses gives them so that that name continues and we reach a certain population of the earth. So the original design of marriage was to populate the earth. Resurrection results in life. Now, when we get to the age to come and we're talking about resurrection, it is life with no more death. Therefore, no need for marriage. But regarding the fact here, as we move to verse 26, regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses? Now we're going to the scripture. Jesus is going to the scriptures. He's going to say, he takes them to Exodus 3, verse 6, which we read earlier. It is a defining moment in which God reveals to Moses who he is. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God has heard at this point, when we look at this text in Exodus, God has heard the cries of his people. He has come down to rescue them according to his promise. And everything in this passage, this Exodus 3, when we consider the context, listen to what Rick E. Watts notes here. Everything in this passage, referring to Exodus 3, presupposes Yahweh's utterly sovereign control over every aspect of human existence and even existence itself. When Moses says, who do I say is sending me, what does God say from the bush? I am that I am. That's the verb to be. That's about existence itself. So we think about that. 
the name of the self-sustaining, life-giving Yahweh is derived from that verb, to be. He is the source of creation's order and life. And Watts again summarizes, to deny then resurrection, to deny resurrection is to deny God his very name and his identity. That's how great this is. That's how important this passage is. That's the significance of what the Sadducees are doing. That's what leads to verse 27. Jesus says, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. To deny the resurrection is to give death a power that it doesn't have. Resurrection demonstrates the very nature of God and his power to bring life out of death. This is what Christ is going to do. This is where he's headed. He's going to the cross. He's going to defeat the enemy, which isn't Rome. It is and it isn't. The real enemy is death. The real enemy is the curse. The real enemy is the accuser. And he's going to overcome. This is the very God who does these things. Yahweh. That is his identity. A couple points of application I close. At Passover, Jesus teaches that those that deny the resurrection, uh, again, this is Passover, so I, I want you to think about that very thing. Jesus goes right to the passage of a defining moment of this. And so he's teaching this, that to deny the resurrection, that the very existence of Israel depends upon the God of the living, not of the God of the dead. And not long from this conversation, as we said, Jesus is to go to his death upon the cross. Three days later, rise from the dead. You can see why the Apostle Paul, if you recall in 1 Corinthians 15, probably the most sustained passage on resurrection itself, you can see why he places so much emphasis upon the importance of resurrection. If the dead are not raised, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ is not raised, your faith is futile. Life, new life, resurrection is the very nature and identity of Yahweh. Resurrection is not disembodied spirits, but new bodies, new bodies. There's a temporary place, right? Upon death, we think we go to be with the Lord, but we are in a temporary place. Every one of Jesus' day knew that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were not resurrected at that point. But God spoke of them as being alive. And when they would be resurrected, they would have resurrected bodies. This is what resurrection is about. It's not about disembodied spirits, it's about new bodies. It's not resuscitation like Lazarus. No, this is part of the discontinuity even again between the present corruptible age and the age of resurrection, which is incorruptible. We will have incorruptible bodies, which also includes this discontinuity of marriage. There's no longer a need for marriage. People no longer die in the age of resurrection. At Passover, Jesus teaches Israel that their very existence, he teaches us that our very Existence is the result of a God who is a God of resurrection, not a God of the dead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for who you are. We rejoice in who you are, that you are, I am. You are the God of the living, the God of life, not a God of the dead. That is the hope that we have. And you demonstrated in your son, Jesus Christ, <clears throat> who died and was raised from the dead by your power and according to your scriptures. Help us to understand that in greater ways.
Help us to see that in your word today. Help us to experience it through the work of your Holy Spirit. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you ready? Please stand for our closing hymn. It's found in the hymnal number 466. What a friend we have in Jesus. People of God, receive the blessing that comes from our God. May the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you all now and forever. Amen.